Good morning and welcome to our webinar, um, Pushing Boundaries in Global Health story Storytelling with creative activist Lisa Russell. Uh, my name is Liz Colway and I manage external affairs for Global Health Council, or uh, we like to uh, call ourselves GHC. Um, for those who are un unfamiliar with GHC, we do represent a coalition of global health organizations and advocates. Um, who seek to garner support from U.S. government and other stakeholders for our causes, uh, which really run the gamut from AIDS to Zika. In order to achieve this goal, we must elevate and amplify the great work that our members and advocates, you all, are doing. Um, storytelling can be a means to share our diverse community's work, and we're excited to have Lisa here today to help us effectively convey our stories to both old and new audiences. So just before we get started, I wanted to go over just a few logistical notes. Um, we are going to be recording this webinar. Um, and if you have any questions throughout, we have a chat box that's on your um, GoToWebinar remote. Um, and when you ask a question, we just ask you to include both your full name and organization. You're welcome to ask questions throughout the webinar. However, we've reserved about 10 to 15 minutes at the very end um, to go over those questions. Um, so without further ado, I want to um, actually hand the mic over to my colleague, Anupana Varma, who's going to um, go through a little bit uh, more detail, kind of the schedule for the webinar and then uh, a brief introduction of Lisa. So here you go. Thank you, Liz, for that great introduction to GHC. Um, I'm Anupama, the lead organizer of this webinar and communications associate here at Global Health Council. Um, as So just a brief outline of the agenda. So uh, Liz already took us through the welcome and logistics. I'm just going to get into uh, how to make the connection between uh, global health and storytelling and set the stage for the webinar and for Lisa to take over. And obviously, Lisa will be going through um, the process of responsible storytelling. And then we will have about five to 10 minutes at the end for Q&A from participants, uh, which I will moderate with Lisa. So. As an advocacy organization, GHC can attest to just how much impact we can create through stories. As global health advocates, we strive to create stories that we hope compels people to act and support our main asks, which include sustained global health funding, um, which is interesting to note that it's just less than 1% of the annual foreign assistance budget. And also one of our main asks is bipartisan support for global health programs on Capitol Hill here in Washington, DC, where GHC is situated. We recognize that we have supported patient advocates in the past at many platforms, for instance, at the 71st World Health Assembly in May 2018 in Geneva, Switzerland, and even more recently at the Interactive Civil Society hearing in New York in preparation for the United Nations high-level meeting on non-communicable diseases in September 2018. We have helped patient advocates and health workers elevate their voices, but is there something we can do better? And what is the missing element that the advocates haven't touched upon? This is where Lisa can provide clarity. In this current climate in Washington, DC, we need to be able to build a strong collective voice from patients and people on the front lines of health and provide a platform for them to increase their visibility and voice. We need to be able to put people at the center and in charge of the narrative, and we need to begin collaborating with quote unquote external experts, such as filmmakers and artists to work with us. Next, my colleague, Melissa Chaco will introduce our guest speaker for the day. Hi, this is Melissa Chaco. Uh, I'm the Policy Associate at Global Health Council, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Lisa Russell. Lisa is an Emmy-winning filmmaker, UN NGO storyteller, and artist curator. GHC has had the pleasure of working with Lisa in the past in the same field, and we are very happy to welcome her back again. Lisa, the floor is all yours. Well, good morning, everybody, and I wanted to first start off by thanking Global Health Council for giving me this opportunity to engage in this uh, webinar with you. Um, I'm just going to go straight into a little bit of my background. I am a filmmaker, but I didn't go to film school. I actually got my master's in public health and landed my first job in Kosovo and Albania. And it was there that I witnessed sort of the exploitative storytelling that was taking place 
with journalists who were very obsessed with telling the story about women being raped as a tool of war. And it inspired me to want to become a filmmaker. So I joke that I didn't go to film school, but I really spent about three years learning the craft. And I now direct, I produce, I write, I shoot, and I edit short films for UN NGO agencies. And I've been doing it for about 15 years. So next slide. I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of leading organizations on a variety of projects, from film projects to curating artist performances at the UN, to facilitating poetry workshops, and a lot more. Um, next slide, please. So I'll just start with talking about the basics of storytelling. Um, Khalil Gibran has said that next to hunger and thirst, our most basic need is for storytelling. Next slide. And so not only is it a form of communication, but it research has shown that actually brain waves of storytellers link up to listeners when they tell a story, which means that it has some sort of appeal to connect us emotionally with the people around us and to help us make sense of our, of our environment. Next slide, please. So what is storytelling? There's a lot of definitions of storytelling. Um, the National Storytelling Association, uh, says that it is the art of using language, vocalization, physical movement, and gesture to reveal the elements and images of a, of a story to a specific live audience. Others define it as the act of telling and writing stories. This is all very basic information that I'm sure we all are aware of. Um, but what I like to do is emphasize that there, are, next slide please, there are a lot of different types of storytellers, um, filmmakers included, both documentary and narrative, there's writers, we have photographers who are storytellers, poets are great storytellers, musicians and others, next slide please, and even beatboxers can be storytellers. Uh, this is an image of a beatboxer who I work with named Chesney Snow, who does physical storytelling workshops, uh, including acting and beatboxing. And he works a lot with incarcerated young men at Rikers. So he's using storytelling in a very innovative, innovative way. Next slide, please. So I also wanna take this opportunity to talk a little bit about what storytelling is not. And storytelling, is not journalism, it's not marketing or messaging or advertising, it's not anecdotes, it's not com campaign slogans, and in some respects, it's not really communications in the tr traditional sense of, of how I remember global health communications being focused on reaching out to media, um, you know, writing press releases and that sort of stuff. So these are all complementary means of communication, absolutely, but they are all very different and they require different skill sets and different workflows. Next slide, please. A great quote that I found is most people tell each other anecdotes, thinking that they're actually telling stories, but an anecdote is something that happens and this is what's important, a story has a structure. So there are story structures that make it memorable. To be an effective communicator, we need to stop telling anecdotes and start telling stories. Next slide. So in the 15 years that I've been working as a filmmaker and a global health advocate, I've seen a lot of various programs, initiatives. Some have been done very, very well. Some have not been done well. and as somebody who curates films, makes films, and screens films, I feel that there is such incredible potential if we do storytelling right, if we are able to, to train and learn the craft of storytelling, we can actually help elevate the stories of the people we work with, of their struggles and their resilience in a way that reaches a large audience and has a greater impact on funding and legislation. I've also seen it done poorly and poorly meaning we perpetuate the sort of emotionally exploitative storytelling that unfortunately our field has come to be known as. Uh, they sometimes call it poverty porn and storytelling is becoming a tr trend. It's a very hot topic, but we need to do it in a way that it, where it remains effective, respected and sustainable. Next slide, please. Why do we engage storytellers and artists in global health advocacy? When I did a 
brown bag at the UN talking about engaging artists in the SDGs, I was saying there's so many things that we as independent artists and filmmakers can be, which is emotional, we can be bold, we can be sort of more activist. And a UN colleague of mine said, oh, you can be all the things that we're told the UN can't be. Uh, so we make great partners and that we can, you know, we can really do, we can really reach into the realms of stories that some institutions may not completely feel comfortable, but we can do so independently, but in collaboration. Um, also, a lot of artists have large group of followers and fans. I'm not specifically talking about celebrities. I think that's a whole different um, area and it's not really one that I work in, but a group of, of working artists who are also educators, they're entrepreneurs, they're social change agents. They tend to have a lot of group, a large group of followers and fans uh, who respect who they are and what they care about. And they also may be caring about the issues that your organization is focused on if they knew about them. So in my world where I straddle sort of both the UN NGO world and the artist world, I see parallel conversations going on. In one week, I can go to a poetry slam and have young people talking about unemployment, you know, the struggles they have uh, sustaining themselves. And I'll be at the UN the same week and they'll have the same conversation, but they, I never see crossovers. I never see UN NGO folks at, at poetry slams or at music events. And I don't necessarily see poets and musicians at UN events. And I think we're doing a disservice because again, a lot of the issues are being covered by both of these, of these sectors. Um, and then likewise, artists and filmmakers are exceptionally good at reaching a wider audience by the way that they are able to to translate sort of the dense topics and policies and programs that we work on to more digestible content what i've seen is sort of a little bit of a blockade is the fact that both sectors don't really understand how the other works they speak different languages they work differently and they have different needs and i think that in order for us to be effective in this field of engaging um, storytellers and artists in global health advocacy we need to do a better job at understanding one another next slide please so I'm going to um, show some clips from a recent film I did called Heroines of Health. Uh, it was executive produced by GE Healthcare. And basically what I'm doing is I'm not going to show the entire 30 minute film, but I am going to show elements of it and the storytelling devices that I use to shoot it to sort of, sort of illustrate components of the craft that I have learned because I've been invested in storytelling for so long. Um, I want to emphasize that for me, and I, I have been publicly critical of the storytelling movement happening in the global health environment because I feel that there's not a, um, a seriousness about seeing storytelling as an actual craft. And then that leads to, you know, some other problems that I'll, I'll kind of talk on and touch upon later. But um, let's go to the next slide, please. So let's start with what is a story. So stories usually have five elements. They have characters, they have a setting, they have a plot, they have conflict, and they have resolution. And the next slide, please. And how we put those items in order determine whether or not we tell an effective and compelling story. Now, this is an image that is used a lot for screenwriters, for example, for filmmakers. Uh, for people who are crafting story structure. And it involves, you will see this over and over again, sort of the setting, there's conflict that happens, there's action, it reaches a climax, which is sort of the most dramatic or emotional part of the story, and then there's a resolution. And you can see this if you, if you diagram any major, you know, feature film that you, that you like, most stories in the craft follow this structure. It looks very easy. It looks like, okay, well, that sort of makes sense. You just need to do this. But when you consider doing an hour interview, for example, for a three or four minute piece that you're eventually gonna put online, it is very difficult without studying this story structure to be able to really take the elements and put it in a way that tells a compelling story. Um, I'll give you another example. When I'm editing the film, when I'm editing any film, I'm sorry, I can come back with a feature length film over hundred hours. 
a shorter length film, maybe 20, 25 hours, and all supposed to boil down to a 25, 30 minute film. So how is it that I can that I can obey this sort of story structure with that much footage and know kind of how to build this storyline? I edit the climax first. So I look at all my footage and I sort of look for the most dramatic, the most, um, you know, if it's if it's a difficult footage, gut wrenching sort of, you know, the the hard part of the story. And I edit that first. And then I sort of edit before I edit after. And I kind of I don't do it chronologically. I don't do it linearly. I start with the climax. And what that also helps do is it helps tease possibly something in the earlier part of the film or the story, such as in the setting or right before the conflict, where people, when they reach the climax, it's sort of like a, an aha moment, like, oh, okay, this is why I saw this before I reached this important part of the story. Now, what I have seen, I, I, for example, curate the Women Deliver Film Festival, and I've done it every conference since 2010. So I have watched hundreds of global health films, hundreds and hundreds of global health films. And what I have seen a lot of is sort of a flat storyline. So I'll give you an example of what that looks like. So here's, here's a young girl named Sarah, and she was born poor, and then she didn't go to school, and then she didn't, she had an early pregnancy, and then she got married too early and then she had a horrible life and then an organization came and gave her services and now she's happy there's no real it's just sort of and then and then and then and then and then there's no defining a character there's no moment that the conflict starts there's no actual climax there might be somewhat of a resolution because everybody likes a happy ending but it's somewhat sort of flat um another uh, pitfall I think that I've seen a lot of global health stories fall into is the fact that they will start the film, for example, with a text slate and basically tell you the entire story up front. So they want to give you sort of the synopsis of the film before you even started watching the film. And then you're not really invested in it. You want you want the story to move. You want to you want it to be a journey and to be an experience that people are invested in. I'll also go back to say this story arc and this narrative arc is what I also use when I curate artistic performances or film screenings. So for example, I was just a juror on the high level political forums, SDGs and Action Film Festival. And we chose to screen six out of, they had 700 entries. We chose to, to screen six of the winning films. And when it came down to deciding what film would be screened when, their suggestion was, let's just do it alphabetically to be diplomatic. But you have to realize that that that's, you're not creating then an experience for the people watching the film. So what I suggested is look at all six stories, six, I'm sorry, look at all six films as one story and let's create a narrative arc from those films. So we start sort of with a film that sort of sets the stage a little bit easy, settling into the film festivals. We have one film that starts to get a little bit more serious, again, more serious. The climax was an incredible film called The Box about a child in Syria and animation. And then the resolution was a feel good film about a program that saves sea turtles in Italy. Um, this can be used, this format can be used in a lot of different ways when you're talking about art or storytelling, but it is a difficult thing to really master. And that's why I keep saying that storytelling needs to be seen as a craft and we need to invest in it and learn it as a craft otherwise we're just kind of perpetuating the same sort of um you know storylines and campaign slogans and whatnot that we've been doing that is you know people are kind of getting a little bit numb to um next next slide please okay um Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Heroines of Health film. Um, basically, it follows three women in India, Indonesia, and Kenya. And when I was asked to sort of talk about how I would make this film, I said, well, I really want it to be character driven. And I, I actually don't want it to be a talking head documentary. So there are a lot of lot of devices that I used in telling the story, and I'm going to quickly show some clips from the film to illustrate some of these points. But some of the things that I did with this particular film is I intentionally broke stereotypes. I wanted to show the women characters as women first before sort of women as global health leaders. Um, I did not want to lead with trauma. 
I have found that the global health community tends to like to lead with trauma. And what that does for people who are not in our field is it puts walls up and it makes it really difficult sometimes to get excited about, yes, I want to come see this film or I want to be inspired by this cause because you have to be mentally prepared to be dealt with like some heavy stuff. Um, I also say don't really be afraid of humor or lighthearted moments. That allows people who are watching your film to sort of breathe a little bit and to take the weight off of some of the things that we're, we're showing in our films. And with Heroines of Health, I actually did not do any talking head interviews, which means throughout the entire 30 minutes, you never see the characters looking at the camera, except, sorry, one moment where I'm in the hospital and, and the uh, Kenyan woman looks at the, at the camera, but there's no sitting down in an office with a lavalier and a light. Um, it's all action. It's all movement. It's all B-roll with her voice sort of underneath or their voices underneath. I also try to find universal themes that all viewers can relate to. That makes it also an easier uh, story to digest for people who either are not working in our field or who wouldn't understand what it would be like to be a midwife in Indonesia. Um, and then again, going back to the sort of story arc and narrative arc structure, I focused a lot on building strong characters, on creating a climax of the film, et cetera. So I'm gonna go ahead and show clips of the film. And I'm going to start with actually, I'm going backwards. I'm, I'm starting with the climax of the film because I'm going to show you or illustrate to you sort of my editing process. And when I talk about climax of a story, um, if we could play clip number three, please. Sorry about that. Okay, so that that was um, really the the most difficult scene that I shot for the entire film. 
And um, and uh, that was probably that was the most difficult scene that I had shot for the entire film. So I chose to use that as the climax of the film, about three quarters of the way into the film, and then I built the stories sort of around that um, to lead up to that climatic moment. Um, I also there are elements of that scene where you can kind of gauge a little bit about Marcy's character of who she is. Um, she mentions, you know thinking of her own child. Uh, that's a universal theme that I think most people can relate to. Um, and so that helped me then uh, set up other segments of the film. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and see clip number two. And I apologize if it's a little jarring. Um, I think if you wanna go back and review it on your own, we can share the, the link to the entire film, which is on YouTube. Um, but if we can go now to clip number two, this is the section where I'm now focused on talking a little bit about Marcy's job, which she actually does, um, because it's not clear from the climax. We weren't going into too much of her sort of technical field, um, but if we can show clip number two, that would be great. and the community programs director at Lola Mutalan. Right now we are going to visit the hospital. We are going to take a tour at the hospital. Yeah. So this is the MCH clinic. We are having a few mothers who just had their baby and they are here for immunization. In 2012 we started a program that supported particularly pregnant women and also children. Because previously in this community, people never used to come to the hospital for the delivery or even for immunization or bringing their children whenever they were sick. So because of that and because many children used to die, we started a program. We called it Safe Babies then because it was, it was targeting pregnant women throughout their continuum of care. But then we again realized that once the children are fully immunized at nine months, then they are still susceptible to other common childhood illnesses. I knew the audio is not working. There were so many children died, and the community were in, at that point where they felt eulogizing all the kids who died is just too many for them. So when we came with the program, we decided to make the community know that the children matter, their lives are important, 
their name when they're born and their deaths matter. So through the enrollment into the program, you have been able to save so many lives, yeah, because of the work of the community health workers and also the hospital staff here. They are working day and night to make sure every child sees their fifth birthday. And I'm proud to say, at this point, so many children from this community are over five years, yeah, compared to the way it used to be before. Okay, sorry about the audio drop. Um, again, you, this film is a lot better to watch um, if you if you want to watch these clips later on. Um, but briefly, again, uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted to do was um, is to is to find universal themes that all viewers can relate to. Um, when she talks about the children at the end, when the audio came back on. She's actually saying some very heavy things. She's talking about the fact that in this particular community, children were dying at such high rates that they would not utilize you. You, sorry, they would not uh, give them any sort of burial things. They would not do death records. They would not eulogize any of the children that were dying. And that's a very heavy statement. And in terms of showing footage for that, I could have defaulted to sort of the imagery that 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 matches what she's saying literally so i could have showed graves i could have showed children's mothers crying i should have could have shown bodies with white cloth over it but i don't think we always need to see literal imagery especially when it comes to dealing with really intense global health um, issues and with death in particular um, so this was a way for me that what, what was going on is basically those two children had a malaria test they got pricked in the fingers um, when they came outside and people were trying to get them to smile they were not they were adamant about not smiling they got the adults gave them candy they still weren't smiling so it's actually when I screen this live it's a moment where people either laugh or you know smile a little bit because it there it's just a, a nice scene um, if we can now, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the very first clip, which introduces Marcy. So again, introducing somebody as a person first, before a person with a problem or before a person um, in sort of their clinical setting. Uh, so if we can play clip number one, please. Um, and just so everyone knows, we did provide a link to the first clip um, in case you're having some issues of viewing the clip on the webinar, but we'll play it now as well. My dream had always been to work most closely with women to help them achieve their dreams, and Luala provided me with that opportunity. In the beginning when I came, it was a bit hard for me because my family was in this room and then relocating to this place, it's a very low resource setting. So it was a bit difficult to figure out how things were going to be. I have a husband and two children, Ethan is three and Maya is six. Both of them live with the dad because around here it was a bit difficult to find good schools for them. So we talked about it and my husband agreed to take care of them in Kisumu. So I work Monday to Friday, but then over the weekends I travel to Kisumu, which is two and a half hours away from here. So I go to Kisumu every weekend and then I return on Monday. Yes. Okay, so that was the last clip. That was the last clip. Um, it looked like it stuck on my computer, so I apologize for the technical difficulties. But we will absolutely make sure you get the links um, to everything and and that you don't miss anything. Um, so basically, what that scene was was setting up who Marcy is as a woman, and what we see about her is that she has a family. Um, she has two kids. 
She also is somebody who has dreams. So this is a story about women working in somewhat difficult environments, but we start off hearing about what her dream is. She doesn't address the camera, hi, my name is so-and-so, this is my responsibility, this is where, we, we kind of get into that later on, but we hear something that really makes her like, you know, um, an interesting person we want to get to know a little bit better, and obviously somebody who's very dedicated to her job. The other story of device that I used in that scene was that I think people were really surprised watching this film that there was a woman who is the breadwinner and her husband actually takes care of the kids and they live in different in different towns. Um, she's a professional woman. If you see the very, very ending of the film, you will hear her talk about the fact that she loves her family, she loves her children, she loves her husband, but she also loves what she does. And this is something that, you know, when we're talking about the, you know, pushing gender equity and global health, we talk a lot about how do women, you know, balance family and work. And she illustrates that through her own life. Um, another part that I forgot to mention about breaking stereotypes is in the second clip, uh, there's a man who talks about losing his three-month-old baby. And again, when I screened the film, I think most people were expecting the mother to speak on behalf of the child and what the child's healthcare status was, but it was the father who came forward. And I intentionally did that again to break stereotypes that men, some men, Many men are invested in the health of their of their wives and, and their children. Um, so again, I'm, that's all I'm gonna show as sort of a case study. And I encourage you to maybe take the notes of sort of the story devices and watch the entire film and see for yourself sort of how I built the story structure. Um, and maybe even look at that diagram that I had sent earlier and say, okay, maybe this is where this is going because one of the things that will really help us improve in our storytelling efforts is really being able to critically look at films, see how the structure is, see, you know, understand what's strong about it, understand maybe something that's not working so that we can be better off crafting and, and delivering stories. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to start to wrap up and then I hope uh, you all have some questions. But I really believe that, that we need to truly build institutional credibility for storytellers in the global development space if we want to take storytelling seriously. If you can go back to the previous slide, please. Um, we need to invite them to sit at the table, for example. So during the town hall, um, can you go back to the previous slide, please? During the meeting of the town hall, um, where the SDG outcome document was being written, there was probably myself and one radio personality that I was aware of who would sort of be considered part of the creative community. And, um, and we were there trying to get language into the SDG outcome document that would acknowledge the role of arts and artists and creativity in helping to meet the SDGs. And because there were not enough artists there speaking up, I think is the reason why that out of the nearly 16,000 words in the SDG outcome document, arts and artists is never mentioned and creativity is only mentioned twice. Um, and so when that sort of thing happens, uh, we can say that we're engaging storytellers and we can say we are engaging arts and storytelling and global development, but if you don't have people there representing the community who, who truly work as professional storytellers and artists, then I think we're doing a disservice to the, to the bigger picture. Um, I think it's also helpful for and this is why I don't advocate for working with celebrities because celebrities are great for sort of one like high impact, quick, you know, put out one blast and people see it. But if you really want to get investment in your cause or your organization, working artists are are really much more available. They're they're passionate, they're interested, and if you invest in them then they're gonna be greater allies to you when they're not even with you at an event. One of the complaints I hear a lot about, and I've experienced myself when I curate artists, is that they sort of feel like they're token performers. Like they'll come in and they'll do a, they'll do a performance at a gala, at a, an event, at a conference. They're never really briefed on sort of the issue or the, or the organization. They come in, they do their thing, they leave, and then they don't feel connected at all. So I think we need to spend more time in, in really massaging and, and, and cultivating sort of artist allies um, because they're there and they want to, they just, it's just, again, the, the language barrier and sort of the work cultures are just so very different. 
Um, I do think that for global conferences, for example, uh, where you can network with incredible people from around the world, we should have artist passes and artist scholarships. Uh, Women Deliver, who I've worked with since 2010, is really an organization where I said, you know, why don't we, why don't we bring artists and filmmakers to the conference and have them present their films? Or why don't we have them not only perform, but sit on panels? And so Women Deliver has been very much embracing sort of the, you know, integrating the creative community in their conference. And I, I applaud them greatly for that. But same thing, you know, the AIDS conference is coming up. It would be wonderful if, if there was sort of a, a, a appeal to artists to sort of get involved because there are a lot of artists who are covering HIV and AIDS, um, you know, work. I would also say that, um, and this is not this is not a criticism, but a little bit of a criticism <laughs> in the global health and development community where we work on such dynamic work, there are really bad speakers. I mean, really bad presenters. And I think that it's not that they don't want to be developed into better speakers, but they don't have the resources or the tools. Artists and filmmakers and people who speak and TEDx speakers and all of these types of professionals know how to stand on stage and engage a crowd. And so not only could artists be used as sort of like entertainment and, and you know, flavor for events, they could actually be useful in integrating them into the work of professional development spaces or, you know, staff, staff meetings. Um, and even with patient advocates that we talk about, how can we get them to deliver stories more effectively, more compelling? in order to create the, the funding and legislative changes that I think we all want to see. And then lastly, um, I'm a big idealist and my dream would, to, would be to see an arts envoys position or office at the UN at these different organizations where somebody can come in and basically be the person who kind of like is the bridge between the UN NGO sector, the global good sector, and the creative community. And so there are, you know, people like myself who do, you know, impact producing, who are able to speak both of these worlds, um, you know, engage us instead of trying to, you know, try to do everything on your own without understanding the nuances, you'll, you'll get farther and you can actually develop a more sustainable um, relationship with artists and also program. Um, okay, next. Next slide. Um, so the big picture is that from where I stand, again, from, from 15 years of, of producing films and art, curating artistic performances, I think storytelling is an extremely important element of global health advocacy. But I do feel that we need to invest in it as a community so that we can make sure that the stories we are telling are accurate, respectful, and responsible. I also speak at Unite for Sight every year. And every year I'm like, we should have, we should have a conference just for storytellers, or we should have a conference just for responsible storytelling. Everybody loves the idea, but it still hasn't happened yet. And I think that's something that I would love to, you know, and I put the call out if anybody is interested in developing this, I think that would be an incredibly valuable um, uh, tool and, and opportunity. Uh, that is going to take some investment. I also think we need to invest time in both inviting storytellers to teach the craft and for you know, people in the field to learn the craft. Um, your field workers, people who are volunteers are telling stories. They come back to their communities, they come back, they do fundraisers, they are telling stories from the experiences they have with their fellowships or whatnot. Let's give them the to really be powerful and engaged wider to be very, um, you know professional in how they and how they talk about how they see much and sustainable initiatives and a movement I'm really on a mission. Like I, I feel like I, I've. If you're at all interested in either creating a absolute storytelling, if that's exactly what you want, to do, a lot of avenues for me to share all this incredible all knowledge I've gathered, all the mistakes. Well. Um, and so
yeah, and so on the next slide, next slide, please. Um, next slide. So I would just say you can follow me. Um, Uh, uh, pretty regular sustainable development goals. I am available to come do work anywhere. Anywhere I'll come around the world, I'll do a workshop. Um, actual film production, I can do it on storytelling, I can do it on. In to funding for you know projects. Um, and this year committed to finding as many and the best. You know who aren't necessarily. Know of any films? If you organization that has films, please consider submitting. That's all I'm going to say. And I will, I guess, turn it over back to Global Health Council and hopefully do some questions and answers. Great. Thanks so much, Lisa. And apologies to all for some of the technical issues that we've had in streaming the videos. Um, just to let everyone know, again, we will be sending out the recording of the webinar as well as the links, um, the clips that were viewed during the webinar. Um, we have received a few questions, and I'm going to actually pass it over to Anu to um, uh, share a couple with, uh, with Lisa and you all. Thank you, Liz. Um, so I'm going to have the first question from um, Lisa Bainey. Um, so she's recently taken a few courses at grad school on storytelling, and she would like to know on how we can tailor the storytelling according to different media platforms like social media apps versus lectures or ads. Um, and if you could provide a few examples, Lisa, about that, um, Lisa Bainey would be appreciated. Appreciate I think I understood what the question is, is how do we sort of telling the different um, sort of platforms and different ways to express it. That is an art and um, it's not something that's easy to just Go um, and people who do who focus on, for example, like Instagram stories. What they have told me is that Instagram stories are not as effective, for example, as one or two look at Instagram because they're in a meeting, they're in a class, or whatnot. So, more and more, you will use other, other outlets, videos. Of media content. If you are a film that is going to sit, that's going to look different than one where you sing it to live audiences. Um, I can tell you, in screening my film, I go to conferences, I go to universities, I go to youth conferences, presenting with my filmmaking or whatnot. And also, there's just a different level of intimacy and opportunities to to tell stories and connect versus just saying here's my youtube channel um watch my videos the other thing that i'll say about that and one of the if you watch my my tedx talk just came out actually yesterday so we're going to share the link to it but one of the things i talked about was how we can use data analytics and machine learning to help us tell better stories because for content producers like myself who create these short advocacy form uh, videos, uh, we have no feedback mechanisms. Like there's there's no feedback mechanisms. If you think about traditional documentary films that have box office screenings, press reviews, or ratings on Rotten Tomatoes, there's some feedback mechanisms. But the only thing that we tend to have are sort of how many likes a video gets or how many shares, you know, what's the engagement, how many people comment. But that's not really a lot of a lot of feedback. So on building 
to age what sort of content resonates with which audiences and also to make sure that we're able to have greater conversations about um, responsible storytelling and also how to tailor sort of you know get out of sort of the poverty porn mode and find other ways of storytelling that can still meet our goals of raising money and, and influencing legislation so i would say you know if if you are committed to a social media um you know social impact strategist sort of career it's something you need to study um and it's very different than what i do um, i recognize that i recognize that i'm not a social media filmmaker that's not my um, if i develop a program i so and create a team and kind of uh, that they have these things. Um, but there's tricks and tools that that each has instead of trying to build it from benefit organizations in the long run. Um, great. So we're almost at time, so we'll have time for just one more question. This is from Leah Breen, who's asking, um, she's worked with global health NGOs in the past who said they didn't have the program budgets to do this type of work. So she's asking, how can we make the development community value and invest in storytelling as an important mechanism for social change? Sorry. Uh, that's a very, very good question, and if there was an e easy answer, <laughs> I wouldn't be a, a struggling working filmmaker. But um, I've, I also know personally the struggles of getting, you know, budgets. Budgets are actually decreasing for film projects. Um, I think that this is, this is sort of, you know, with UN Foundation, with Ford Foundation, with all of these organizations that fund both global development projects and separately. Um, you know, filmmaking or creative programs, finding ways to 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 emphasize that our kind of storytelling is important, um, and that we need more we need more funding and more investment. Um, you know, people there are organizations who make a lot of money off of poverty porn, and I think that's why they don't venture out into telling stories differently because they have seen and they it works for their their kind of constituents. But I do believe inspirational stories as well can move people just as much as like tragic stories i do believe inspirational stories can move people so i think it's i think i think as this i don't want to call it a trend i don't want to call it a movement as this interest in storytelling is growing i think it's up to us and the organizations who are seeking funding to integrate storytelling into programs or into staff positions or you know get unrestricted funding and do something with it um, it it can't just come from from us it's got to come from the from the sector from the community to say th this is this is necessary in our field um, I, I do believe that if we continue to tell the stories that are sad and tragic and, and, and you know, exploitative, that the general public is going to just stop listening. And so I think we're at a critical point where we can make changes. We just got to convince funders and donors and, you know, people who support programs to invest in storytelling. Um, thank you, Lisa. So uh, we're at time right now, so we'll be unable to take any more questions, but uh, we highly encourage you to sign up for her newsletters and also check out her website for um, future workshops that can help you in your storytelling goals. And of course, we look forward to continued collaboration with Lisa in the future as well. So please do stay in touch with GHC for more updates. As you can see, we are active on Facebook, Twitter, we have our weekly newsletters. Um, so we hope you'll follow us on all of these um, sites. And also, if you're an organization member that hasn't connected with GSA before, please do feel free to reach out to us uh, with more questions about how to join us as a member. Um, we have the link for you right there. And yes, thank you, Lisa, for that amazing content today. I'm sure uh, a, lot, a lot of us are going to come away from, from this presentation with great takeaways. And uh, yes, please feel free to stay in touch. And um, thank you for joining us in this webinar. <laughs>